Welcome to our Bible study, Lesson 10 of the Bible Prophecy and the Book of Revelation by Dr. Bill Waddell. Book of Revelation, where we're going to be, of course, and uh, a difficult book. It's actually uh, the, reminds you of the title of the book. The title is The Revelation, um, the revealing, if you will. Uh, the word in the Greek is, is a, a word picture. It's as if you have a cloth drawn over something and you pick the cloth up, you're able to now see it. That's what the, it's uh, apocalypse is, is the word in Greek, and that's literally what it means. So it's not a book intended to veil things from you, it's a, it's a book intended to, to, it's not a book to keep things from, it's a book to reveal things to you. And so if you're, so if, if we're confused by it, then we're not coming at it correctly, and um, not, not to say that it's, it's, it's not a simple book by any stretch of the imagination, but it is, it is definitely a book where you cannot afford not to do your homework. If you don't do your homework, you're going to be uh, spinning your wheels. So um, part of my job is to do my homework to make sure you do your homework, but I'm, but I'm not here to, to help you think. I want you to think for yourself. Uh, mine is sort of just a primer on this, and uh, there is a lot more. The, the Bible is probably 80% prophecy. So to know what the prophecies are in the Scripture are going to take a lot longer than the four, three or four months that we spend together. So, so let's begin with a word of prayer, and then we'll get into this very interesting book. God, we thank you that uh, you have decided to reveal to us your truth. You don't have to tell us anything. Uh, you didn't have to save us. You didn't have to do anything for us, but you've done all that, God, and you've guided us and you're holding us by the hand. And we pray, God, as we study this book, that it would be what, what it's titled to be, uh, a revelation and that you would enable our minds to understand, but we know it's more than intellect, it's more than, than uh, brain capacity or being able to piece things together. It's, it's hearing from your Holy Spirit, and so we're asking you to guide us by the hand through your Holy Spirit through this process as we learn uh, what you have revealed to us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I told you last time, the book of Revelation, you think of the book of Revelation as sort of like a landing strip with airplanes flying in from all over. And uh, the, the problem with it is, is that if you're the air traffic controller, you're trying to decide what's going to land here, you don't know where these planes originate from. So you've got to go back and find where they come from in order to understand why they're coming to the spot where you are. Revelation is sort of like this landing strip. It's also sort of like the, uh, I don't know how it was when you were growing up, but uh, the, the textbooks that I had when I was in high school, junior high, elementary school, if there were questions at the end of a chapter, often those questions were answered at the end of the book. Well, Revelation represents that in some ways. The problem with it is, is if you just go straight and read Revelation, all you're reading is answers. It assumes that you know the questions. So if all you're reading is the answers and you don't know the questions, you're going to be confused. Well, Revelation doesn't just do that. It not only raises, I mean, answers questions that have been raised elsewhere in the Bible, it also raises questions that are answered somewhere else in the Bible. And so you're crossing both ways. You kind of have to know which way to go. And most of the questions that it, that it raises are answered in the Old Testament, or most of the questions it answers were raised in the Old Testament. So, so again, the Old Testament underscore how important it is for us, for us to know the Old Testament. We're going to be seeing here in chapter 5 basically is uh, the throne room, given a view of the command center of the universe. And this command center is the place where all the plans of men and of demons and of the devil come to nothing. Because this is where God is. And he's seated because, because there's nothing to be worried about. He's totally in charge. So let's take a look. We're going to read the entire chapter uh, 5 together, and then we're going to go back and hit the majority of the high points and maybe a little bit more. Chapter 5, and it says, I saw, again, this is a th current theme. This is a consistent theme throughout Revelation. John says, I saw, I saw, I saw. Je Jesus told him, write the things that you have seen, the things which are, and the things which shall be after these things. Chapter 4 starts the after these things events. I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne, we've been introduced to him in chapter 4, right? This is none other than God himself. A book written on the inside, and we say right there, it's definitely not a book. So if that's what your Bible says, you can scratch through that. I give you that permission because I know for a fact there was no such thing as a book when this was written. They had no idea. Books were not written to the second, were not created, I shouldn't say, uh, the, as far as binding like you have here, we're not created until after the second century. So it would have been a scroll. Some of you have old uh, King, James, King James Version. It says a scroll. That's actually more accurate. But for our ears, at least, book sounds like something because it makes better sense in a Western mind. But actually, it's not a book. It's a scroll. And right hand of him who sat on the throne, a scroll written inside and on the back, sealed up with seven seals. 
Now, this is really strange looking. Uh, to you, to me, not to John and not to the people he would have written to. This would have been recognizable almost instantly. It doesn't require explanation. We're going to have to explain it because we don't know it. And we have two problems. Number one, we don't live in the first century. Number two, we're not Jewish. Those two things are going to keep us out of a lot of secrets of the Revelation. So we're going to have to learn how to be thinking like a first century person and thinking like a Jewish person, especially from here on, in order to really get a grasp of what's happening. I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and to break its seals? And no one in heaven, I'm sorry, scroll, and to break its seals. No one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the book or to look into it. Why does he look in those three places? Did you go looking for people in those places? Just a question. We'll get to that. I began to weep greatly, he says, because no one was found worthy to open the book or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, stop weeping. Behold, the lion that is of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has overcome so as to open the book and its seven seals. Very Old Testament titles for the Messiah. And I saw between the throne with the four living creatures and the elders a lamb standing as if slain. By the way, if it was dead, it wouldn't be standing. So what does it tell you? So it looks like it's dead, but it's not. Having seven horns, seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he came and he took it, that is the scroll, out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb having each one a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song saying, Worthy art thou. Now this doesn't, those kind of statements don't happen anywhere else in the Bible except to God. So right here you have the angels and the four living creatures, the 24 elders and four living creatures, worshiping Jesus as if he were God because why? Because that is what he is. He is indeed God. Worthy art thou to take the book and embrace its seals. For thou wast slain and didst purchase for God. By thy blood, men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation, and thou hast made them to be a kingdom and priest to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. Mark that very carefully. Earth? Thought we were going to heaven. Uh uh. And I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And every created thing which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all things in them, I heard saying, so animals can talk, trees, at least right here they can. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever. Notice they, they, they equivocate between the two. The Lamb and the one who sits on the throne are equal. Because they are. Four living creatures kept saying, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped. And we'll stop right there because we have a lot uh, to consider here, lots of stuff to bring together. So, first of all, uh, just this whole issue of the book, it says, as it says there in more modern translations, but it's actually a scroll, like I said, books, books as far as binding pages together, like you have in the sense of a book, it doesn't happen until after the second century. So nowhere when you read a book in the Bible is it speaking of a book, actually. It's speaking of a scroll. The entire Bible is written on scrolls prior to, prior to its ever being written in a book. Uh, these scrolls were primarily made, made out of two different types of things. One's, one was vellum, the other one was papyrus. The typical thing you made them out of generally was papyrus. Uh, they would hammer out eight by ten sheets of this, this plant, basically, if, for lack of a better term here in the West, uh, like bulrushes or, or uh, cattails. And they would take and strip the pith out of them, and then they would lay them out, they would bleach them, they would hammer them out in these thin strips, uh, and then they would join them in, like I said, eight by ten pages, if you will, join them horizontally, I'm oh, sorry, horizontally, and then they, because your typical scroll was only about ten inches high, and, uh, or eight inches high, I'm sorry, and ten inches long, and then they would run them and they would roll them up on these wooden dowels. And uh, the pith was laid out and hammered into, like I said, thin sheets. And rows were laid out vertically and horizontally. So what you would have is you would have these, like I would take a strip this long, and I would lay it across the strip the same width running this way. So I would, you would cross hatch them. Hatch them like this, hatch them co constantly back and forth. So you were unable to tear it easily. So it had, it had grain running two ways. Uh, 
the grain running vertically was always the back of the sheet because it was difficult to write across the grain that's running this, this direction. You wrote on the front of the sheet where the grain was running horizontally. And so they would write on the front, they would almost never write on the back unless under, under special circumstances. And that's what you have here. You have a special circumstance. So it's not a typical scroll in which you would write like the book of Isaiah on or whatever. The book of Isaiah was not written on the back because it didn't fall under the guidelines or the headings of, of what's happening here. Again, if we were first century people and we saw this, we would immediately know what this is. We would know that this is either one, the last will and testament, or two, a title deed to something, or both. In most cases, a, uh, you know, a last will and testament is also a title deed to whoever has passed away and uh, have, has left you this property. Uh, like I said, the only exception to writing on the front would be in the case of these legal documents. Both Augustus Caesar and Vespasian, Titus Vespasian and Caesar, both had their last will and testaments written on the exact same type of documents. It was very common. So here's Paul writing in the same centuries in which these two guys, guys died, and they would have known Paul, not Paul, John, would have known what this is, so would have all of his readers for the most part. They would understand this is the way you do these legal documents. So what's happening here in heaven is God is handing Jesus a legal document. And what it actually is is a title deed to everything that there is. Starting with us, but not stopping with us. Everything else, what, what did God create? Well, everything. What did Jesus buy on the cross? Not just us. Everything. Everything. So he's handing this to his son is what's being depicted here, this legal document. And what you have here, of course, if, if a last will and testament, if I write a last will and testament, the only way it comes into force is if I die. It's, it's of null and void until as long as I live. So, but the problem with a last will and testament, so I die and I leave uh, someone as an executor, but the executor doesn't do his or her job, then there's a problem. I have no way to come back from the grave and take care of my last will and testament. That's not what God did. So God writes his last will and testament, if you will. This is what you have. The book of Revelation is a fact effectively what that is. Writes his last will and testament, dies in the person of his son, resurrects to become the executor. So it will be carried out. He is the executor of his own will. So, boy, talk about an odd uh, situation. And the transaction that's taking place here, uh, it is assumed by the Spirit that apparently we've memorized the entire Old Testament because it's, it's assumed here that we see a process, what's called in the Old Testament, kinsman redeemer. You familiar with the book of Ruth? The book of Ruth is very important. It's not just important so that you could know the lineage of Jesus. Of course, we learn the lineage of Jesus from the book of Ruth. But it's also very important because we need to understand the process that God is working through here in Revelation. Ken, the, the kinsman redeemer process of the book of Ruth is a very strong foreshadowing of Revelation. It's going to be important for us to understand it. So what happens in Ruth? Do you remember? Got a, got, a guy by, got a guy who marries Naomi. They have two sons, one named Kilion, the other one named Malon. The first name means sickly, and the other one named means puny. So why do you name your boys that? No idea. I'm just telling you, that's exactly what the Hebrew says. And sure enough, I mean, it's, it's prophetic because these guys don't live very long. They go off to the land of Moab. They pass away. The two sons do after taking wives, uh, one of them being Ruth, of course. And uh, then the father-in-law, the, or the father, the, the husband of Naomi, passes away. And so Naomi goes back, completely penniless, back to Israel. Uh, but her family, her husband and her husband's family is actually very wealthy. But in order to leave Israel, they had to leave all of their properties. All the farm and all the ranching, they had to leave it in hock. They had to pawn the whole thing off. The difference between pawning, you pawn things here in the United States, and they sell it over to the pawn shop, you never get it back. It's not yours. You have to buy it back to get it back. It's not legally yours. In Israel, you couldn't legally sell anything. All you could sell was the productivity of the land. So in that productivity, that land would return to you every 49 years. So I'm in financial situation, I'm in a legal situation, and I need the money that my land could, could produce, but I can't wait for the land to produce for the next 20. Let's say I, I need the 20 years of, of value of, out of the land in order to take care of debts that I have. And so I would sell it to David back here, who's a farmer, he knows what price of land is like. I would sell it to David. I wouldn't sell him the land. I would sell him the productivity of the land. So David and I would sit down and determine over the next, let's say it's going to be 20 years between now and the 49th year, which is the year of Jubilee. And that 49th year, the next year, that land returns to me because it never can be legally David's. He can own the crops, but he can't own the property. 
And so I would hawk it. I would, I would, I would put it in a pawn to David, and David would, would reap the benefits of having that by, uh, by getting the production of the land. But once the 49th year got here, I got it back automatically. The only way I could get it back out of, from David is one, either, either I raised the funds or a relative of mine, a kinsman redeemer, would raise the funds to buy back the remaining amounts of land. So let's say David bought it from me for the 10 years of production. I left it with him for five years and I raised the money to, to get it back from David. I have to pay him for the remainder of the five years. Now that's, I think that's pretty awesome, David. You don't have to work the land. You get paid for the next five years. You and, you and your wife take off on vacation. It's pretty good. Yeah, it's pretty, yeah, let's do it right now. <laughs> so that's what's happening in the book of Ruth. Naomi actually is from a very wealthy family. Her husband was worth a lot, and they had huge holdings. But because of the drought that was in Israel, they left Moab, and they basically put their land in hog for whoever wanted to farm it. But now that she's come back, she's without husband. She's without sons. Women had no way of making money. And she has no way to buy back the land. We have no idea. It doesn't tell us how long the land can be in hawk until the 49th year gets here. But all she has to do is wait till that 49th year. Well, it may be. So all she got to do is hold it together for 49 years. She's going to get her land back, right? Well, that's a long time to get it, keep it together. All she has going for her is that she has this daughter-in-law who is a Gentile by the name of Ruth. They come back. They're penniless. They have nothing. All they can do is go and beg. She sends Ruth out to do it. She happens into, it's a, as the Jewish, Jew, Jewish rabbis would say, that's not a kosher word, happens into the right field of Boaz. Boaz, turns out, is a kinsman. He recognizes who Ruth is, or he's told who Ruth is. He's been told what she has done, that she's come back with her mother-in-law to this land, even though she had no reason to do that. Uh, no promise of a husband, no promise of any kind of benefit. She just did it totally selflessly. He really respects that. He gives her a huge blessing, gives her, you know the story, I think, of Ruth, this huge blessing. Naomi sees this and says, wait a minute. She remembers the Bible. She's kind of been in the dark for now, for a while. She remembers that the Bible says that, that the Jews have a right to redeem their own land. If you can find either yourself can raise the money or a kinsman can raise the money. She's reminded Boaz is a near kinsman. Maybe he would perform the rights of a kinsman redeemer for us, pay off David for the remaining amount of productivity of the land, however many years he has left. And we can get the land back, start making produce, and uh, start making money and get out of the poorhouse. And so that's what they're hoping. Of course, that's exactly what takes, takes place there. But not only does uh, Boaz buy the land, he also takes Ruth as his wife, which that's a part of the Jewish leveret marriage. So if my brother marries a woman and dies before they have children, I, as the near kinsman male, have to marry her legally. So as I've said before, you'd be much more interested in who your brother buried, I guarantee you. <laughs> Take him in the back room and say, listen, you are not marrying that ugly woman because sure enough, you'll die out here on the road somewhere and then I'm going to be stuck with her. So you had a lot more to say and who, you know, who they married back then, because boy, you never know. Or y'all better have a kid really quick so I don't have to marry that girl. But, but uh, so, so what's happening here is Ruth got married to a kinsman of Boaz's. And it, actually, there's a nearer kinsman in the story. We're not told his name. But that guy defaults. He decides not to take, take his right as a kinsman redeemer. So it falls to Boaz. Boaz buys back the land and takes Ruth as his wife. Then they have a child together. But the child, listen to me, is legally not Boaz. It's legally the child of the dead brother who was married to Ruth. You follow, you follow that? So, so here's my question from Boaz. What's he getting out of this? She must have been really good looking. That's all I got to say. <laughs> because, man, he's doing nothing but laying out a bunch of money. The first child that they have doesn't belong to him. It legally is, it, it, he becomes the heir of the land that Boaz had to pay the money for. So you follow this, this process because they couldn't sell their land. It had to stay within the family. And the way they ensured that was this whole Everett marriage and this kinsman redeemer thing. And why am I saying that? Because it is key that we understand that for the sake of this picture. So what you have here is you have a Jewish redeemer taking a Gentile bride and returning the Jew to their land. That is the story of the entire Bible. That's the entire Bible, especially Revelation. You have a Jewish redeemer, Jesus. I don't know if you've taught, heard, ever heard about him. He takes a Gentile bride. That's effectively the entire New Testament, right? I mean, here we are. How many Jews we have in here? Yeah, really. Church has basically been a Gentile movement, unfortunately, for the Jews. 
But when the Redeemer comes ultimately to, to, take the, to make the full transaction, so he's taken a Gentile bride. He's gonna, she, we're, we're still in the honeymoon process, I should say, this, this process where he goes away to build a, a, a dwelling place for his bride. It's like a one-year, we, we would call it a, um, what's the word? Being engaged, but they weren't engaged. They were married. It just was no consummation of the marriage, but they were married. So you would be married for an entire year before you consummated because he would have to be off building, proving that he could take care of you, building a house and uh, raising funds and all that because women are expensive, we know. <laughs> and so, 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 my wife isn't here, I'm pretty brave. So he, he would do all that and then at the end of the year he would come out and go, that's the exact process that we're in. So Jesus has taken us to be his wife. He's gone off to prepare a place for us. He promised that, right? And he's coming back to receive us unto himself so that we will always be with him. It's a marriage. It is the Jewish marriage. It is, he's the kinsman, redeemer. But when he takes this bride ultimately to be where she's going to be, he's also going to return the Jew to their land permanently. And that's the, that's the issue. That's why we, everything from this point on takes a very Jewish turn. Church isn't mentioned again after chapter 4, after chapter 3. And things become very Jewish because now the process, he's taking care of the Gentile bride. Now he's got to take care of the Jewish mother-in-law, if you will, and, as in the case of Naomi. So, so all that to understand this, the requirements of a kinsman redeemer are the same requirements that we needed for a redeemer. First of all, it has to be a kinsman. Couldn't be just anybody in Bethlehem who could get Ruth and Naomi out of hock. Couldn't be just anybody who could marry Ruth and bear a child who would be the heir to the land that he had bought back. It had to be a kinsman, had to be blood relative, had to be from the same tribe, the same clan. So uh, the same is true with us. In order to be redeemed, listen, takes a kinsman. An angel can't die for you. Has to be a man. Why? Because that's what we are. Since we're humanity, it has to be a human that takes our place. We cannot be redeemed. The God in heaven who is uh, certainly willing and certainly able to redeem, cannot redeem us. Hear me carefully. Because he is not kinsman. He's not related to us. The God, God in heaven is spirit, the Father. He says he who worships us must worship in spirit and in truth. But God becomes a man in the person of Jesus and the woman of Mary so that he can take our place, so that he can be a kinsman. So that number one. Number two, he has to be able to purchase. So it's not enough. So let's say I'm, you know, I feel, I feel compassionate toward the cause of humanity and their great sin. So I say, I'm going to lay my life down for the cause of humanity. What good would that be? None. I'm just as, my sin debt is just as much as yours, if not greater. So I can't even pay my own stuff off. How can I pay your stuff? I was really nice of me, by the way, to offer. And I need to, I get a check mark for that. But I can't do anything for you because I'm just as much as dead as you are. You see, we're all in hawk here because we've, our, our sins that we've been sold and we have to have someone who is a kinsman to redeem us, who's not only a kinsman, who is able to purchase, someone who's sinless. So I've got to have a man who's sinless, and there's no such thing. There's no such thing. And then in addition to that, I have to have a person who's willing. In the story of, of Ruth and Boaz and Naomi, there was a closer kinsman, remember, but he was unwilling to redeem. You have Boaz, the willing, he has to be a willing uh, uh, has to be willing in the process. So number one, he's got to be a kinsman. Number two, he's got to be able to purchase. Number three, he's got to be willing to purchase. Number four, he has to assume all debts, all of them. All of her problems become his problems when he marries her, and so do Naomi's. So he's buying into this, David. If you ever did this, man, you better really uh, be careful because, man, talk about something. So, so the problem in, chat, in verses two through four is who's qualified for that? That's why you see so you don't understand why John is crying. Why is he crying here? Well, we know the whole story, but John understands the implications. There is no one qualified who, who is a man and also sinless and, and able and willing to purchase us because we're all in hock here. Well, as you know, the story, God took care of that in the person of Jesus. Jesus has not only redeemed us, He's also returned, he will also return Jew to the land. That is what Revelation is concerned about. Jesus, by the way, is not American. What is he? He's Jewish. He's coming for the Jews. 
And he's coming to put them back in their land, the promised land that he's given to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's coming to put them back in all the promises of the Old Testament that are guaranteed to them uh, unilaterally, not bilaterally. He's coming to make sure that those are good. And he's going to take care of that 100%. The kinsmen, though, served two roles. So one was a redeemer, like Boaz, we see here, but it also, they also were avengers of blood. There were no police. So when a crime was committed, the one who enforced or took care of the crime, so, so I have um, Frank over here who is, uh, has something stolen from his trailer. The people that would take care of the, uh, finding the guy that stole fr something from Frank would be his relatives. Now, not to say that the rest of us guys wouldn't get together and try to help him, but ultimately the responsibility fell to his relatives, to his sons, to his daughters, to his, to his cousins, to his ankle. That was just the way that they ran. So the police was based upon who you're related to. Same is true with the kinsman redeemer. The kinsman redeemer, almost, not, not only did he redeem, he also was the avenger of blood. Now again, what do we have here in Revelation? That's exactly what Jesus is. Understand why he, and here, here's a question for you, and I made this earlier but I want, to look at, I want to look at it one more time. No one, notice in verse 3, so he's looking for the qualified person, this kinsman, this one who's willing and able, assume all debts. No one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the book and look into it. So, so I understand why he's looking on earth for men. Why is he looking in heaven for men? Why is he looking under the earth for men? Because apparently men are in all three places. So there you go. I mean, the Bible clearly teaches us in other places, but here's one of the places. It just assumes that you understand why he's doing this. Because that's where you find humanity. You find him in all three places. You find him in heaven at this point in time. You find him on earth. You find him under the earth. That's, by the way, they're still located in those three places today. Not permanently. At least not, not in two of those places, not permanently. One of those places is definitely permanently here on earth. So, so back to this kinsman. Um, John can't hold back because he understands what's at stake. And the elder explains what's taking place here in verse 5, and he uses very Jewish titles. The, the one here in, uh, let's just stop weeping, behold, the line of the tribe of Judah. Now we think that is a New Testament term because here it is in the New Testament. Actually, it's Old Testament. The root of David. These are very Old Testament Jewish terms for the Messiah. Has overcome so as to open the book, the scroll, and it's seven seals. He's, he's now the executor of this will, and he, has, he is worthy and is willing to, uh, to, to redeem, and that's what's being accomplished here. This elder explains. He calls him the root of David. A root is, of course, the source of a plant. So I, I thought that Jesus was the offspring of David. Is he not? Isn't that, isn't that what the angel tells Mary when she, before she conceives? He's the offspring of David. So how can he be the root of David? That's at the bottom. And the offspring of David, which is at the top. How can he be that? Jesus actually uses this as a, uh, as a way to confuse the Jews who were trying to ask him all kinds of questions. He said, what do you think about the Christ? He starts firing back at them. What do you think about the Christ to these Jews who've been trying to corner him? Whose son is he? They said to him, the son of David. That's the correct answer, by the way. He is the son. He's the offspring of David, right? He said to them, then how does David in the spirit call him Lord? Well, if he's his son, if anything, he's the Lord over his son, right? So how does in the spirit David call him Lord? And he quotes from their Old Testament. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool. If David then, here's Jesus' this point. If David then calls him Lord, how is he his son? It's a very good question. It says from that point on they wouldn't answer, ask him any more questions because he cornered them with their own Bible. The answer to that question is very simple. Well, I shouldn't say very simple. It's a simple answer is the incarnation. That's how. So the Lord, who has always been, became incarnate in a physical body that was related to David. He, became, he was the root of David. He was the producer of David. He's the creator of all. And he's also the offspring of David at the same time. So anyway, there you have it right here. The same thing happening here. This root of David, he's also the offspring at the same time. Verse 6 is, of course, of symbolic of Jesus. And let's take a look at it. I saw between the throne of the four living creatures and the elders a lamb standing as if slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent out into all the earth. What is this? Well, first of all, a couple of things to point out here. As if slain. So notice he's in heaven. 
He still bars, bears the marks of what happened here on earth. That's very interesting. Are you getting, maybe, why? Well, let's ask the question. So why doesn't God fix him? Why doesn't God fix him? No indication that you and I are going to have our, our personal scars. We're not going to have our disabilities and all the other things that happen to us on earth when we get up there. But why does Jesus? Because, because it's his... It's his merit badge, if you will. It's, it's the only man-made thing, as someone said. The only man-made thing in heaven is the scars of Jesus. They are his for us. They are his receipt guaranteeing our pass, passage there. I, I, I'm, I'm sinful. I'm wicked. I'm unworthy to be here. No, you're not. Here's the receipts, if you will. The, the, take and touch my hands. Take and touch my side. Look at my feet. These things are our receipts. They are the guarantee of our payment. It says he has seven horns, seven, of course, is a number in all through Revelation. And seven is a number not of God. Some people call it that, but you've got a demon or a devil in here with seven heads. He's definitely not God. It is not the number of God. It's the number of completeness, a full round of something. So every seven days, the week starts over, if you will. This, this completeness, a complete set of days was seven. In Revelation, in, in this case, the seven horns refer to strength. So the horns are symbols of strength. So, so seven horns means full or complete strength. He's com he has all power. He has all authority. And then you have these seven eyes, which are called the sevenfold spirit of God. Again, it requires the Old Testament for us to know what this is. Zechariah chapter 3. This is Zechariah 3, 8 and 9. And then the very next chapter, chapter 4, verse 10. So these are about, about six verses apart. First of all, Zechariah 3, 8 and 9, it says, The stone that I've set before Joshua, remember this convoluted uh, prophecies, that uh, amalgamation of prophecies that God gives to Zechariah, and he's putting them out there, and here's one of them. The stone that has been set before Joshua, this high priest, on one stone are seven eyes. So here, there we go. How it relates directly to our passage here. What are they? What's well, going to go on and tell us? Behold, I'm going to engrave an inscription on it. So Jesus calls himself the stone, right, that the builders rejected. Did God engrave the stone called Jesus? Yes, he's got engravings, doesn't he? It says it right here. It says he's got the same marks that we gave him here on earth. God allowed him to be engraved for us. And notice the result. And I will remove the guilt of the land in one day. That's exactly what he did. Jesus died one day. The land was healed as a result of it. These seven, is skipping down to the next, next verse, these seven, it's inspecting to know that we're talking about these seven eyes in the previous chapter. These seven eyes will rejoice when they see the plumb line in the hand of the rubble. They, these seven, are the eyes of the Lord roaming throughout the earth. Again, you just, I'm just trying to give you just this, this, this flavor of how Old Testament the book of Revelation is. It introduces these, these issues, these idioms, they have already been told. We've already been told about them. Here we have it in Zechariah. We've already had it explained to us. And the Holy Spirit just marches through Revelation as if we've memorized the whole book of the entire Old Testament. And, of course, we haven't. 7 and 8, there's a very interesting point to be made here, and I want you to look at it real carefully here. And he came and took it out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down with before the Lamb, having each one a harp, and pay attention to this one. Golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Any saints here today? So, you ever prayed before? Hmm. So what is this? So is God not listening to your prayers? He's just stockpiling them in some bowls up there in heaven? What is this? What's this all about? Well, there's a particular prayer that you, I hope you've been praying. Jesus taught us how to pray. He taught us in the model prayer. Do you remember the model prayer? It's always... It's also called the Lord's Prayer, but it's actually more better known as, or more accurately called. The model prayer starts off like this. How, let's, can we say it together? Our Father, right? There's the first phrase. So we address Him as God, who art in heaven. How will be thy name? So, so number one, we address Him as God. Number two, we, we praise Him. And then what, what comes next? What is it? Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Notice the first request that we make is that God would fix this place. Thy will be done, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Ahead of your temporary request, I'm not trying to downplay your stuff, but like I said, the, the, all the problems in this room are only temporary. The real issue is this kingdom. The real issue. 
And, and of course, we've lived through a terrible year, and we're now in a terrible political cycle, in my, in my opinion. And um, I don't know if anything more, we should be praying that God would fix this place. There's only one fix. And it's not the Republicans get elected. It's not, you know, the right Congress and all that stuff. It's a monarchy called the reign of Jesus Christ. Jesus taught us to pray that he would come and fix it. Have you been praying that way? I hope you have, because that's the model prayer. Ahead of all your other requests, your request needs to be, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The prayers that are being poured out here are those types of prayers. Paul says, a crown will be given to all those who long for his appearing. There's something wrong with the New Testament church who doesn't really care whether Jesus comes back or not. Or haven't mentioned the, the fact of uh, how important it is that Jesus come and that his will be done. We have so many other prayers we offer to him, and I'm not saying he's not interested in those prayers. I'm just saying in, in, the, in the order of priority, thy will be done and thy kingdom come is ahead of all the other requests. That's the way he sets it up in his model prayer. We're not following that, unfortunately, in many cases. So in, in, in verse, verse 9 and 10, of course, they sing about the blood that thou with their own blood have bought men of every tribe, tongue, and language. I, I was listening or reading uh, J. Vernon McGee. J. Vernon McGee had a woman who came to his office. They'd been, they had a whole Sunday in which he preached on the blood of Christ, and they sang about the blood of Christ, and this woman made an appointment to come see him, and she just said, I, I, I just am so bothered by um, this whole emphasis on the blood of Christ. Can't we just back off on that a little bit? And he says, yes, ma'am, we can do that. He said, in fact, maybe I'll just ask God that he wouldn't uh, embarrass you by taking you to heaven so that you'll have to sing about it. That's what he said to her. So that's my kind of pastoral counseling right there. <laughs> and they shall reign. Now notice carefully here, and I pointed it out before. Verse 10. Thou hast made them these people of every tribe, tongue, and nation whom Jesus has bought with his own blood for God. God has made them to be, notice, a kingdom and priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. So for, let's deal with a couple of things here. Notice, it's not just, it doesn't just say we're priests. We're familiar with that, right? We're, we've been made priests to God because of what Jesus has done for us. Jesus is the ultimate high priest. We're also kings because only kings can reign. There's only three groups of people in the whole Bible, Old and New Testament, who fall in the category as both priests and king. There are actually two are just singles, and then one is a group. Uh, Melchizedek was both a priest and a king in the Old Testament. Jesus is both a priest and a king, and the church is made up of both priests and kings. Very unique standing for us. But notice where it says, says that we reign. This, this is an important point because Revelation won't make sense unless, you get, unless we get this through our heads. Notice where it says we reign in verse 10. What does it say? They will reign where? Not in heaven. Not in heaven. I thought we were going to heaven. We're going to be in heaven forever. Nowhere in your Bible is that taught. Not one place. Well, my mama taught me that. Well, I'm sorry. She's in heaven now. She knows better. That is not accurate. The Bible says that, yes, you pass away today, you're going to go to heaven to be with Christ. And that when Jesus comes back on the rapture, he's going to take us back in heaven with him. But it's only a temporary place. Our permanent place is here. Because Jesus is coming back at the end of Revelation to establish a thousand-year reign in which he reigns on the earth. Not without us. As I said, we're going to reign on earth with him. And then he's going to remake the heavens and the earth. And we will remain here as the, uh, as the, the, the city of God descends out of heaven to earth. And the dwelling places, it says there in Revelation 21, will, of God will be among men. Where do we dwell? Yeah, not in heaven. Heaven wasn't created for us. This place was. We're going to be here forever. So just, just got to get it straight because why, why would he go about all this trouble to, to take care and remove the earth of its usurpers if he's just going to get rid of the earth and we're going to be in heaven forever? Like I said, you were taught some, or you assumed something that is inaccurate, that we're going to be in heaven forever. It's just not in the Bible. Nowhere. Not, not, not a single place. So this is a prelude, what's going on here. And uh, this prelude is the beginning of a campaign that's going to be waged. And uh, the four living creatures there in verse 14, it says, say amen, and the elders fell down to worship. And chapter 6 begins the breaking open of the scroll. And before we get to chapter 6, or which is not going to be until next time, we need to back up here because you're expected, we're expected to know what happens here is directly tied to something that has already been discussed with us by the Holy Spirit in the book of Daniel. 
If you've been a part of this church very long, you already know what this teaching is. We're going to go over, if nothing else, just to read it into evidence. Because our understanding of this is going to be, um, it's, it's going to be very important. So Daniel, let's turn, turn with me to Daniel's tap, chapter 9. Daniel 9. We're going to be going to a couple of places. We're going to be going to Luke 19. You might want to mark that as well. Luke 19. Just hold your, hold your spot there. I'm going to put my little marker wherever it went to. Oh, I fell on the floor. Luke 19, and let's now go over to Daniel chapter 9. So Jeremiah, Ezekiel. I'm sorry, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel. Daniel. Now Daniel is very important book as far as understanding Revelation. In fact, if you will, it is the bone structure. It is the, the basic uh, outline that Revelation is written upon. So we, unless we understand the outline, the, again, the, the whole fleshing out of all of it won't make any sense or be harder to make sense out of. You're expected to know what happens from this point on is uh, basically the, it, the expansion of what Daniel describes here in Daniel 9, verses 24 through 27. Incredible prophecy, very mathematical, very precise prophecy. To my knowledge, the most precise po- prophecy in the entire Bible is what you have here in verses 24 through 27. Let's read it. We'll go back and go over it rather quickly. Like I said, I'm assuming since you've been, if you've been here very long, you've been underneath my preaching, and you've heard me talk about this before, so we're not going to go into every last detail. But, um, but it is a part of other sermons, and, and I'm not sure which ones, but they're back there. Book of Daniel, actually, the wind study a couple of years ago. So 70 weeks. So this angel Gabriel comes to Daniel to give him the full answer to what's going on here, and he gives this amazing prophecy. Uh, predict, the predictive element of this thing is so, so precise. 70 weeks have been decreed for your people and for your holy city. The first question that you would have as a Jew, not as a Gentile, because 70 weeks means 70 weeks, right? you got 490 days as far as we're concerned. But for a Jew, a week, there was several levels of weeks. One was a week of days, seven days ended in, marked with a Sabbath. Then they also had a week of weeks. That's the way they marked one of their, uh, the, the Feast of, of uh, Pentecost was marked by, they count off seven weeks. And then they had a week of months. Their entire uh, worship season, their, their, seven, their seven feasts were marked on these seven months. And so you had, a, you had a week of week, a week of days, a week of weeks, a week of months. You also had a week of years, a sabbatical year. And then you had a week of week of years. Every 49 years you had a year, year of jubilee. So when, when a Jew hears the word week, he has another question. What, which week are you talking about? For us, as like I said, in Westerners, we only think of days. For them... It was a question of, is it a week of days, is it a week of weeks, is it a week of months, or is it a week of years? Well, in this case, we don't have the time to explain it to you, but it is talking about a week of years. So 70 weeks of years is 490 years, all right? So let's move on. 70 weeks have been decreed for your people in your holy city to finish, notice the, the scope of this is huge, to finish transgression, to make an end of sin, to make atonement for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness. That's the end. That's after the return of Jesus. So 490 years until all this comes true, yep. The key is to understand the last seven years are not contiguous with the first 483. That's the key. And it's going to break them up here for us. To seal up vision and prophecy. So all the prophecies and all the visions of God are going to be sealed up in 490 years? Yep, that's exactly what it says. To anoint the holy place, which is called, talking about the temple in Jerusalem. So you are to know... Oh, so this is a revelation for Daniel. You're to know this, Daniel, and discern that from the issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the Messiah repents. So he's given a time gap here. From this until this, he gives us an exact amount of time. Until Messiah the Prince, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. So that's 483 years out of the 490. There's going to be 483 years between when this starts and the Messiah gets here. Start counting the days. And it will be rebuilt, the city that is, with plaza and moat, even in the times of distress. And then after the 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off. That means to be killed. So the Jews had a huge problem with Jesus saying that he was dying. Remember, every time the disciples, he said that to the disciples, they would rebuke him. Peter took him aside and said, no way. Here it is in their Bible. 
It promises the Messiah is going to be cut off. He's going to be killed. There it is. The Messiah will be cut off, having nothing. And the pre people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city. That would be the Romans. And the sanctuary and its end will come with the flood, even to the end that there will be wars and desolations that are determined. And then he will make a firm covenant with the many for one week. Like I said, we're, we're only missing one. Sixty-nine weeks have been taken care of since the time of the Messiah. The clock start ticking until the time that he comes, 483 years. Now we only have seven left. That seven is a floater. It's off by itself. Here's the seven. That seven doesn't start, notice, until a firm covenant is made with the many, referring to the Jews. In the middle of that week, so three and a half years into the seven years, he, that is this prince who is to come, will put a stop to the sacrifice of the grain offering, and on the wing of abominations will come one who makes desolate, even until the complete destruction of one who's decreed is poured out upon those who make that one who makes desolate, which is the whole concern of Revelation. Whole concern of Revelation from chapter 6 on is just that seven years. So whole, all of Revelation is contained in only one verse here, verse 27. So you can just set that one aside right now because we're going to take three months to discuss verse 27, basically. What I want to discuss with you in conclusion tonight is what happens in the previous verses because we have precedent. And the precedent says is that God says exactly what he means. In other words, if he says it's going to be seven years, it's going to be seven years to the day. And we know that because of what he did with the previous 483 years that he prophesied here. So, so what he says here in verse, verse uh, 25, he says, So you are to know and discern that from the issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the Messiah repents, this time gap, so this time gap of 483 years starts with a particular thing. The issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. We know exactly when that was. Well, this is Daniel. The, the city has been destroyed. Uh, the city wasn't, the, the altar was rebuilt. The, the temple was rebuilt. But the city itself wasn't restored until there was a proclamation called the Proclamation of Artaxerxes. 4, 4, 445 B.C., discreet decrees of the walls, the city be rebuilt. And it's recorded for us in Nehemiah chapter 2, verses 1 through 8. Nehemiah becomes the builder. It's the whole concern of the book of Nehemiah is this whole rebuilding of the city. We know exactly when that was. So we know exactly when the clock starts ticking for these 483 years. That date is March 14th, 445 B.C., and we have to thank for this uh, Sir Robert Anderson, head of Scotland Yard. He wrote a book in, in 1980, 1880, 1894 called The Coming King, and he very thoroughly researched this and demonstrates that uh, all the dates and all the timings of all this, and, and we have a lot, we owe a lot to him. This is a mathematical prophecy. It requires us to know a number of things. It requires us to be able to add. Can you add? You wonder, because people come up with answers here that are, in, in, <laughs> they are incongruent with what the, the angel Gabriel actually says. Requires us to be able to add. So it says seven weeks and 62 weeks. It gives us 69 weeks, which is weeks of years, 483 years. So there's one math problem solved. 483 years is, is what we're looking at here. It also requires us to know when this 483 years starts ticking off. We know the date. Like I said, the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem was March 14th. 445 B.C. requires us also to know how many days there are in a year. Do you know? How many? 365 is the wrong answer. 360 days in a year. Something happened. We don't know what. We don't even have 365. It's something every year. It's either plus or minus that, right? How, how, by the way, if, if, you're, if, if you do any kind of architecture stuff, how many degrees are there in a full circle? 365? No. 360. So the earth has an, has an elongated orbit. Something happens. Prior to 700 B.C., we don't know what. Prior to 700 B.C., all of the calendars that were known to man, including the Aztecs down here in Central America, uh, the, the Roman calendars, the Jewish calendars, the Japanese, the Chinese, they all had calendars worth 360 days. All of them. Something happened after, prior to 700 B.C., after 700 B.C., their calendars all changed. As the Jewish calendar would have 360 days, but then every fifth year or whatever, they would add six days or something like that. They, would just, they all had different ways of handling it. We've now come to a global agreement how we do that with this leap year you know, and all that stuff. But the biblical day, or I should say the biblical year, even in the New Testament, is 360 days. So when you're adding this math, you need to know what numbers you're dealing with. So if you're working on a 365-day year plus a leap year, you're not, the math's not going to work. So, working the equation, we have 69 weeks of years, which is 483 years. We, it starts uh, in uh, 
445, March 14, 445 BC, 483 years, 360 day years, gives us 173,880 days. It's very mathematical. Now, I didn't make this up, okay? It's in the Bible. It's been there all along. And uh, as someone inaccurately said, well, 173,880 days since the, de the decree to restore and build Jerusalem is about the time of Jesus. And my answer to them is, I don't think God deals in approximations, do you? God deals in precision. Precision, in fact, that's exactly what you find this prophecy to be. If we add to March 14th, 445 B.C., 173,880 days, we come up with April 6, 32 A.D., which is right dead in the middle of the week in which Jesus is crucified. So, wow, that's amazing right there. So which day is it, though? He did a lot of things during that week. The final week is of Jesus' time in Jerusalem before his crucifixion. Those seven days, eight days right there are the concern of three quarters of the book of Mark. So what point of the day, what, what does he do? Which, which day is it? Of course, our immediate assumption is the day he's crucified, and that would be incorrect. That is not the day. You think about it. If I'm God and I'm 483 years, or, more, or actually before that, I'm, I'm 500, day, 500 years before the crucifixion of my son, and I'm going to pinpoint an exact day in the future that my son is going to fulfill. I'm thinking, I'm predicting the day he cru he's crucified or the day he resurrects, right? He doesn't do that. He doesn't predict that day. The day he predicts, this 483 years later from the time, again, the exact day, from the time that Jesus is, uh, from, from the time that, that they are to expect the Messiah. And by the way, they had this date. The Jews know. One of the most important dates in their calendar was the date that they were to rebuild Jerusalem. And they had this prophecy. This, this is a Jewish book. It's not a Gentile book. The book of Daniel is very Jewish. They've had it in their possession a very long time. And I don't know if you've noticed, the Jews are pretty smart. They can do math. So when they know when it starts. They know when the clock, stock, clock starts ticking. They know the number of days because they're not dumb. So why weren't they standing there waiting for Jesus? They didn't believe it was true. That's a problem. And, well, and, and again, they believed it was true. They just didn't believe it was literal. And I would say to you, what's the difference? So but it, if, I, if I tell you I'm going to be back in 10 days, but you don't believe it's literal, then what are you saying about me? I'm saying I'm not telling the truth. Oh, he won't be here in 10 days. What are you calling me? A liar. What were they calling God? A liar. The God was not a liar. So he pro predicted 483 years ahead of time exactly when they were to expect Jesus. And that's going to take us over here to Luke chapter 19. Let's take a look at it. Jesus spent most of his career, his three-year career, keeping people from acknowledging that he was the Messiah. Right? He would heal somebody and say, tell no one. Seems counterproductive, doesn't it? I mean, aren't you here to tell? His brother took him aside. His, this is not the way someone runs a political program. Go show who you are. Like I said, open the sky and fly around the earth a couple of times and empty the Mediterranean. Why don't you do something if you are the Son of God? He doesn't do that because he says, my time is not yet. What's he talking about? Now, we assume it's his crucifixion. That's not correct. There, there's a time that's predicted in Daniel, and he's working toward that time. But prior to that time, he doesn't allow anybody to acknowledge that he's king. He, he, the, the disciples, they say, you know, who do you say they am? You are the Christ, the son of the living God. He says, great, tell nobody. <laughs> Pretty counterintuitive. The, uh, the demons say, we know who you are, the Holy One of God. He would shush them. Be quiet. Come out. Why? And, and why would a demon acknowledge that Jesus, unless he's trying to preempt something, why would he acknowledge him as king like that? Why not lie? And say, well, you wouldn't lie in the presence of the Son of God. A another occasion, he feeds the 5,000. It says they immediately wanted to make him king. He, he disperses them and goes off by himself and sends his disciples out on the boat by themselves. And he goes out walking to them later on in the night, and you know the whole story. But the important thing is, is they try to make him king, he wouldn't let them. But then there comes a day in which not only does he allow people to acknowledge him as king, he orchestrates it. So we've had a total change of gears here. So it's three years now, Jesus has been saying, no, 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 don't tell anybody, shush this, shush that, don't, don't do this, don't, don't acknowledge me as king. And then there comes a day in which he makes sure they acknowledge him as king. Let's watch, let's read it. Verse 28. Chapter 19, did I say that? 
And after he had said these things, he was going on ahead as ascending into Jerusalem, because Jerusalem is uphill no matter which way you go. And it came about that when he approached Beth Fage, he's coming in from the east, and Bethany near the mount that is called the Olivet, the Mount of Olives, he sent two disciples. Well, you know where we're headed, right, with this, don't you? This is just triumphal entry, as so-called. Go into the village opposite you, which you are to enter, and you will find a colt tied on which no one has yet ever sat. Untie it, bring it, and if anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Thus you shall speak, the Lord has need of it. And that was supposed to work. <laughs> I'd be thinking, well, that won't work, and sure enough, it did. <laughs> Those who went away and found it, just as he told them, and when they were untying the colt, the owners said to them, why are you untying the colt? And he said to them, the Lord has need of it. And it worked. like I said, it worked. They brought it to Jesus. So notice he's orchestrating these whole, all these events. This is not a regular day. This is a special day. They brought it to Jesus, and they threw their garments on the colt and, he, and put Jesus on it. And as he was going, they were spreading their garments in the road. And as he was now approaching near the descent of the Mount of Olives, so he's headed downhill to Jerusalem, the whole multitude of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the miracles which they had seen. Blessed is the king who comes. They're quoting from Psalm 118, which is a messianic psalm. And the bad Jewish, the Gentile, I mean the Pharisees and the Sadducees knew this is a messianic psalm. Well, they have a huge problem with him calling him king when in fact they believe he was an imposter. So they're going to correct him here. They're going to try to. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord, Psalm 118. King, peace in heaven and glory on earth. Some of the Pharisees, in case we missed it, because the Pharisees always correct us when we miss something, even though they're wrong. They correct us by being wrong. Some of the Pharisees of the multitude said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. No, don't let them say this about you, because it can't be true. Notice what Jesus says. So every time prior to this, Jesus, don't tell them I'm king. Don't tell them I'm Messiah. Today it's completely the opposite. Notice what he says to them. If He answered them, If I tell you if these become silent, the stones will cry out. So prior to this, he wouldn't let anybody call him king. Today, he says, if no one calls me king, the stones are going to call me king, because this is a special day. This is 483 years, the end of the 483 years of James' prophecy. When he approached and saw the city, he wept over it. How many times has he been to Jerusalem? Every single year, three times a year, for 33 years. But this time, it's over. So notice, this is four days before he's crucified, but he weeps over the city today. Why? This is a special day. They're not waiting for him. They don't believe the Bible. They don't believe Daniel. They give him 483 year lead to the exact days. They don't believe him. Huge mistake. Notice he doesn't give them a second chance. Why should he? 483 years of chances, I, I think, is plenty. Notice verse 30, 42 is a clincher here. If you had known in this day, which day? Today. Even you. The things which will make for peace. But now they will be hidden from your eyes. Notice, not at his crucifixion, but at his triumphal entry four days before. Because that's the exact day. That's April 6th, by the way, 32 AD. That's the exact day, 173,880 days since the decree to restore and build Jerusalem. It's the exact day. He holds them accountable for that day. Notice what he says as a consequence. For the days shall come upon you when your enemies will throw a bank, a bank upon you. This is talking about the Roman invasion of five legions in 40, 40 years. And surround you and hem you in on every side and will level you to the ground and your children within you. Killed over a million Jews, by the way, in that process. They did. And they will not leave on you as one stone upon another because you did not recognize the time of your visitation. Woo! 483 years to the day. He was there. Held their nose to it. They weren't there to see him. They paid for it. He and their temple had been casting him out, and then he goes on from there. He held them to this day because God says what he means and means what he says. And what we're expected to know, what we're supposed to know, is what happens from, in Revelation from chapter 6 on is the fulfillment of that one left seven-year period. So he fulfilled 483 years to the day, literally. What's the chances of these last seven years being literal? Super good. In fact, these last seven years are the most prolifically enumerated sets of years, a time period in the entire Bible, and that includes Jesus' first coming and the creation epic. Chapter 6 is a beginning, and these final seven years are divided exactly into halves, three and a half years, to the day. In fact, they're told to us several ways. They're told to us in the, as, as months, 42 months, three and a half years, 360 day uh, years. 
is exactly 42 months. They're also told to us in the sense of days, 1260 days, both in the book of Revelation. In Daniel, they're called times, time, and half a time. Again, it refers to the exact same amount. So these seven years are broken right down the middle. We're told in Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, that the one who breaks it in the middle is this prince who is to come. He breaks this covenant. It's covenant he makes with Israel. And we're going to be introduced to this guy uh, here in the beginning of chapter 6. We're going to be seeing this guy who comes to make a covenant with Israel. A guy riding a white horse with a bow in his hand, but no arrows. It's a covenant that he makes. And it's going to start the clock ticking this last seven years. But this seven years are the most specifically enumerated time in all the Bible. More said about these seven-year interval than any other time in the entire history that the Bible uh, lays out for us. So we'll stop right there. God, we thank you for your revelation. And we do thank you that you are informing us uh, so that we can know, so that we can be better disciples here, not so that we can just know how great heaven is and how you're going to take care of us. And even though those are important things, but it's also important that we know who we're supposed to be today and how we're supposed to treat people today and the urgency of it and the inevitability, inevitability of what you're going to do and what's going to happen to people and the decisions they make in this life and the consequences of those decisions. So God, I pray that we would be burdened with the truth and uh, it would dominate who we are, what we say, what we do, where we go. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for visiting. Find us at www.islandbaptistchurch.org.